Hello, Sermon Brainwave listeners and viewers. This is Matt Skinner. I'm inviting you to join Caroline, Joy, and me on a retreat next summer so we can explore together the craft of preaching. The three of us will take to the road to host this preacher's retreat, July 29 through August 2, 2024, at the Ghost Ranch Retreat Center. It's located in the remote and beautiful high desert north of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the awe-inspiring terrain that Georgia O'Keeffe painted. As we're all together in residence at Ghost Ranch for four nights, our program will include presentations, panel discussions, corporate worship, lectionary-based Bible overviews, small group discussions, and preaching workshop exercises, all designed to enhance your gifts as a biblical preacher. You'll meet colleagues in ministry and feed your soul in a contemplative and sacred landscape. To get more information and to sign up, you can find a link on Working Preacher's homepage, or you can go to ghostranch.org, click on Workshops and Retreats, and type Working Preacher into the search box. The program cost is $350 per person. In addition, Ghost Ranch has different kinds of lodging options available for you to purchase, depending upon what kind of a retreat accommodation you desire. There is a cap on enrollment at 75 participants, and limited scholarship funds are available through Ghost Ranch. So sign up today. I hope you will join us there for this unique opportunity. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 8, 2023, are from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Our alternate first reading is Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 4, then 7 through 9, then 12 through 20. Psalm 80, 7 through 15. We continue our reading through Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. And Matthew 21, 33 through 46. Yet another parable from Matthew. Number two of three, as we talked about last week, which are helping us think about by what authority does Jesus do these things and what does that look like? So, And yep. reminding us and remind, as you reminded us who Jesus is speaking with and where at this particular time. Right. So we're in Jerusalem. We've arrived in Jerusalem and location is everything. Location, location, location. Right? Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about this authority. Well, I talked a couple of weeks ago that I, I I like to look for the kind of absurd moments or the illogical moments in a parable. And, and, and here, first of all, it's when the it's when, when the landowner thinks, I'm sure they'll respect my son. <laughs> like, like, what could possibly go wrong here? You know, these yeah. seem like reasonable people. I'm sure they would, you know, understand. You know. So that's, you want to know what the son is thinking when dad <laughs> thinks, like, I'm sending you. And the other one is when they think, let's kill him. And then this will all be ours. I mean, the, the unspoken assumption there is nobody is ever going to hold us to account for our bad behavior. Right. And right. if this landowner is a stand in for God in some way, shape or form, then it's God will never call us to account for whatever. And that's the absurdity. It's like, what kind of world are you living in? Landowners don't let tenants just take over their property. In right. fact, Especially killing their child. Well, exactly, right? It's just this assumption that like there are no consequences to my actions, which mm -hmm. I know some people do live that way, but that's kind of absurd if you ask me in terms of what's going on. And so that says something, right, about the depths of their sin. It says something about the depths of God's desire to connect and give these people one more chance. And it'll end in a crucifixion, not to spoil the ending to anybody, but... You know, well, we can't we can't help but read this uh, in our post resurrection imagination. It, it just it it just leaps out at us in terms of uh, precisely how we treat God, or how we um, how we uh, ignore the authority of God 
uh, to use to use your word, Caroline. Um, and, and this parable becomes such a uh, a, a challenge, even without that um, crucifixion in in and of itself, as you've already described, Matt. Um, who would think? In, in what world would you just get this after you've you've killed the the owner's son? What makes you think the the owner's going to give it to you? And yet, the kind of God that we serve is literally trying to make a way for even at that level of bad behavior for us to be received. Wow. Now you're talking absurd. And it, there is a kind of moment of clarity here, which is, I, that's what I'm drawn to is often in the parables. <laughs> it's just, it's like one, is there one moment that I actually understand it uh, or kind of have a moment of understanding? <laughs> and, but that is, uh, that is verse 43. Therefore yeah. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. I mean, that, and, and in what way that is like Matthew, a summary of Matthew, uh, you know, that's Matthew in a nutshell is that the being, being a part of the kingdom or being um, a leader in the kingdom or uh, it is, is, absolutely about what fruits will be produced yes. and and what that is what, and that absolute expectation that this is what it means to be a part of the kingdom of god and 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 again as we talked about last week going back to the sermon on the mount and uh and you know you are the light of the world you are the salt of the earth and so it's one of those moments where uh, where we all have to ask each uh, as leaders, but as members of the, of the body of Christ, as members of the kingdom, what, what are we producing fruits of the kingdom or not? It's just, it's pretty clear, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I, I think, th I think there's something homiletically worthwhile in that clarity uh, that, that, that's where a preacher can simply say, say, this is, this is what we're about. And if we're not producing fruits of the kingdom, then we don't, we, it's, it, it shouldn't be ours to have. We don't, we don't deserve it. And, um, and what makes you think going back to what you were talking about, Matthew, what makes you think that you can behave in such a way and still be, uh, you know, as still think you have the kingdom? How dare you? <laughs> really? And, and 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 remembering these are being addressed to the religious leaders. These are being to addressed to the folks who are uh, challenging Jesus for uh, extending this grace outside of the boundaries they have set up. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the clarity of the word as we preach. You know how closed is our community? How closed is our congregation? Um, are we willing? to um, live in such a way that others are not only invited in, but welcomed in. I think we need to point out as well, this is in line with everything we've talked about, but the parable has a history of interpretation about rejection of Judaism for the sake of Gentiles. Right, and so I, right. um, the verse you, you highlighted, Caroline, uh, yep. verse 43 in particular, it will be taken away from you and given to a people, literally to an ethnos. And yeah. people yeah. don't know Greek. Uh, the plural of ethnos, ethne, is usually translated Gentiles. It means the nations. And so this has been taken in some circles to imagine that Jesus is here saying, kingdom of God is now a Gentile thing, or that right. the, the church is its own new ethnos. Its own, and so there were some early Christians who talked about Christianity as a third race, pagans, Jews, Christians, and obviously the superior quote unquote race. I mean, a different understanding of race than we use today, but um, you can see how that kind of reading quickly gets really ugly in a hurry. And so just to, some people might be familiar with that. Some people might need to be reminded like what Joy just said, this is, he's addressing religious leaders here. He's right. addressing people That's who've right. got a particular responsibility for shepherd the folks. And that'll come out, I think, when we look at Isaiah five a little more too, but. And yeah, I to highlight that, that 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 needs to be untaught. I think in a lot of sermons, absolutely, uh, absolutely, and that the 
commentary is re- is helpful there, so just toward the end of the commentary of that reminder. Um, but I'm 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 really glad that you brought that up, Matt, because uh, that you know the point here is not an allegory in that Judaism is futile, right. and so we really have to be very careful in that. Right. Um, but uh, but that um that's a moral challenge to those who do not do the will of God. And, so um, yeah. If the religious leaders are the ones that are supposed to be doing um, what they should know is that the reason for the existence of the called out people, Israel, God's people, is for the sake of all the world. Genesis 12 follows Genesis 11. I will make of you your descendants a blessing for the sake of blessing all these others. And whenever Israel has forgotten that, Israel has not embodied the good of God for the sake of the world. And I think Jesus is reminding them of that. And uh, so I, I, I appreciate your challenge, Matt, because we have done the very same thing. Um, the way that this is written, there were Jews and everybody else, because it was written as a Jewish document. Well, the reason the Jews exist is for everybody else. And Jesus is saying, don't forget that. Isaiah? Isaiah. Yeah. I'm seeing a connection here. No. Between Isaiah. Yeah, the vineyard. Got it. (laughs) This is another weird thing, right? They probably think Jesus is just retelling Isaiah 5, then he turns it. Mm-hmm. Where the the problem the vines are doing just fine in Jesus's version, mm-hmm. um, so that's part of the beauty as well as he takes this familiar image and then recasts it or turns it uh, on them uh, in this moment. So it's worth knowing Isaiah five simply to get a sense of what Jesus is up to. But I also love the way Amy Odin just talks about this as God is this careful, patient gardener who's like. Who's just what? What's going on? I did everything I could, and so she mm-hmm. talks about Isaiah's invitation to truth telling. You know this idea of when something's broken, who stands up and says this is broken? And in this case, it's God, and God's frustrated. But this idea of broken heartedness and broken open heartedness in the commentary I found really compelling. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I would, I would direct well, people. To that. Yeah to that commentary and throughout all the words of Matthew, isn't that exactly what Jesus is doing? This is what you think you've heard. This is what you think you know, listen to me, and you will hear it in a way that is challenging your comfort and familiarity. Maybe our society right now needs to get away from the familiarity and comfort and to return to the absurd countercultural goodness and graces and generosity of God. Exodus 20, the (laughs) Ten Commandments. So I feel like I set myself up there, or at least I was hoping to do it. Uh, We Maybe I was going to say, it sounds like you paved the way on purpose, maybe. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yes, I did. A little bit of a a segue there. Yeah. Just a little bit. This is, I think it was you, Matt, that brought up, uh, or maybe it was Caroline, a a week or so ago about how God um, does before God requires. Um, God has liberated. Um, so this the, the, the words that we were reading before and here are not simply a moral code, but I am the Lord your God because you know what I've done for you. I've done this against the gods that you know. I brought you out of a ruthless, oppressive forced labor. Now, Now that you know who I am and what I've done, and I claim you, this is how you can represent me in the world. And uh, that word uh, to serve God or to to worship God is, is that same word in Hebrew. And so rather than serve or even worship Pharaoh, they are now uh, invited to serve or worship the creator God. And this is not instructions for a twenty uh, for a fifty nine minute once a week gathering. This is how do you live your life twenty four seven, three hundred and sixty six days a year, um, counting those leap years. 
Um, <laughs> and, and, and there's several ways that are life giving as we, we, you know, we've talked about, this is, this is reading uh, the 10 words in context. Um, what is life giving? What is life giving? Not just for myself and my tribe, but is life giving for the alien that is life giving for those who work for me, that is life giving for creation. Um, this is not about, do I know these words and can I recite it? This is about, will you live in response to the graciousness of God in a way that demonstrates your love for God by being the embodiment of this grace? Yeah, and that the commentary reminds us of that, uh, but also the tradition of how each of the commandments begins with the promise. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Do not whatever. And also the distinctiveness of how, as the commentary points out, that the distinctiveness of who God is, God identifies who God is before the, these this invitation to live in the covenant relationship with God. And I am the Lord your God who who saves, right? Who frees, who liberates. And 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 so how then we are then how how to even like recast liberation and freedom, right? In and and yet that juxtaposition of and do not <laughs> or and honor and uh, i think that's an important um that's an important moment or important reality of this text is that 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 freedom and liberation from oppression is then also has a demand on us uh, and lutherans out there will recognize this in the way luther works us out in the freedom of a christian mm. um, but yeah, and that that that's the fundamental. That's the that's what God, how God describes God's self as a liberating, freeing God, and um, yeah, and and what and what difference does that make for how we live, and how and if if God is a freeing, liberating God, and we're not about that same kind of freedom and liberation, mm -hmm. then do we really? I think we've skipped over that part of who God is. And so it, it's a claim, it's a claim about God, but it also should be a claim on, on how we, how, again, how we embody that love and how we embody that, that freedom. And so how is it that we turn around and oppress? How is it that we turn around and, and captive and, 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 and make captive people? Um, so it really is a, I think you, that's a place to sit for a little bit, but even before you get into the, uh, what then this freedom looks like, what does this liberation look like? In the context of uh, the Exodus 16, Exodus 17, where the people were willing to die and go back to forced labor because they were familiar with it. These, the, these 10 words are actually a countercultural way of existing. And so um, they are being told, this creator God is the one that you are to serve. Don't make an idol of any of creation. And it repeats the creation narrative. You know, anything above the earth, in the heavens above, on the earth, or the seas beneath. Well, that's the creation. That's the echo. Remember this story of your ancestors. And, and, and then uh, the, the promise of a day of rest for people who have for generations been enslaved. Talk about a new way of, you are not going to run your world in that same type of workforce system. Um, and that is the place where you will rehearse your story and remember who and whose you are. And the whole reason they wind up in slavery in, 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 in Exodus 1 is because there arose a king who did not know Joseph did not know their ancestors. And so um, I love the commentary, commentaries, um, attentiveness to the abuse of this text for a, a, a child or the misuse of this text for children who have been abused. Um, but I also want to flip that in terms of the invitation to honor one's ancestry and heritage when you have been 
enslaved by a people who made the other of you and did it because they did not know your ancestry and heritage. And, and God is saying, you can know who you are. And, and then those practices that mean this isn't just about me and my tribe, but it is about life, as we talked about before, for others. And so it moves from that, who is God, to how do we embody the goodness of God in the flesh in how we treat others. I, I don't know. Um, I'm coming to love. I, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I'm, I'm rereading the Ten Commandments, and I'm coming to love them as a word of freedom rather than as a word of don't. So thank you for that, Caroline. Yeah. Uh, the psalm, I uh, there's many ways you could use the psalm, uh, but I, I also was, uh, I was drawn to the commentary of the suggestion of this three-stage sermon on Psalm 80. Uh, Thanksgiving for God's love in the past, which certainly connects to some of the themes that we've already talked about, naming our grief in times of loss or abandonment and confessing our hope that God, God's mercy will shine on us once more. Uh, so whether or not you preach on that or the way in which you might incorporate some of that, um, some of those claims into your, your sermon on the other text, I think could be helpful. So I really appreciated that. Absolutely. The imagery here is so beautiful. It's a, it's a perfect pairing with Isaiah 5, mm -hmm. where you've got a God who tenderly cares for a, something, a garden, or in this case, a, a vine. But then it's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> How come you let it get overrun? And here it's a little bit different uh, for the reasons why in Isaiah 5, it's not producing, but it's it makes me think about the the way that, in this case, a nation, in other cases, a neighborhood or a family or a congregation, like the way it holds its memories of how we're going to describe the good times and the bad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the images that get used. So to have this this vine, like you brought a vine out of Egypt. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I imagine somebody like walking through the desert with a <laughs> the pot, right? <laughs> this vine that they snuck out and hoping this thing makes it till they can plant it. And, you know, you do about the nations. There, there's some complications there, I recognize, but let's, <laughs> let's keep this happy for now. All right. You know, but anyway, that's this idea of the images you use to remember who you are and who took care of you and how they, how that God took care of you, or even how ancestors or other people who came before you took care of the, the thing which is worth exploring in some ways, whether that comes from a church's name or comes from a church's neighborhood, comes from a church's art or architecture is um, maybe not for a sermon, but it's worth exploring with this. I just think it's, it, yeah, whatever. We, I say the Bible. So, you know, I <laughs> love talking about how do people's memories and stories get told and retold or allegorized or uh, figurativized and this mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Metaphorized. Anyway. What's that? Metaphorized. Metaphorized. Yeah. Similiized. Yeah. Are we creating yeah. a dictionary right now? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Uh, Philippians, our third reading from yes. Philippians. So and I I would just point I would point people to the commentary too. I mean the, the bullet points on the commentary of of uh uh particularly uh, particularly in the way in which Paul often gets uh, captured as uh, a convert, right? And his conversion to Judaism and which is I I, I don't find accurate. And um, but that continuity between um, what he's known and now recognizing or realizing that God is doing something new. So it's not a rejection of the old. <laughs> it's this, it's this, it's this, you know, recognition. New, new, yeah. These new recognition, right. It, and Paul himself describes it as a revelation in, mm -hmm. in Galatians one sixteen, or really the Greek is apocalypsis. Mm -hmm. And it's a revelation of, of of God, uh, you know, God doing something new in Jesus, and and so I think when you 
which is always a, a really important reminder when you're preaching Paul. Paul is not, you know, the second founder of Christianity. <laughs> um, he's he's uh, and the way in which he describes that calling and what that means. So, yeah, the commentary mentions this uh, briefly, but you, I think you need to look at. You don't necessarily have to read it, but you need to look at verses two through four a and and remember what Paul's looking at here we're not exactly sure who these other agitators or who these other teachers are that paul is intent on uh, on engaging or discrediting here but it it is this has something to do with the law certainly and and so paul's again telling his history not because i want you all to know who i am you know it's not like paul thinks you know lesson five is spiritual autobiography and here's how you write one it's it's he's laying out the ways in which the law has not proven to provide what he has discovered uh, through Christ. And it's mm -hmm. what I'd love about this passage is it's just, it's a revelation that Paul was no tortured soul. Like he was not, he did not find the law oppressive. As far as we can tell, he did not find the law a source of condemnation. He, found the law beautiful and a source of life, we assume. And he was very Jewish <laughs> in the sense of fully embraced. I mean, he talks about his zeal in other places, but here it's about his piety. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet still, like you said, Caroline, you know, Christ breaks through and shows him. I think it's less about the insufficiency of those things and more about like, what does Christ, what is God doing in Christ? And Paul What's sees that? like, this yeah. is what the law was expressing in some way. And I, I'm sure Paul's Jewish um, contemporaries who weren't convinced about Jesus as the Messiah must have thought he was a little nuts yeah, here. Yeah. But but it's um, it's just, it's really beautiful that he uses himself and in some ways his own body or his own history and his own deep religious piety as the as the the object lesson, so to speak. It's not the right word, but I think you know what I mean. You're nodding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the in the literary movement of that text, uh, just a reminder that we've lifted up uh, humility, and uh, ultimately the humility of Christ. And yeah. it is only after Paul has set that. Let's be real clear that this humility is what we're looking for. It's only then that he begins to say this about himself. And uh, I read that and, and would encourage folks to, to recognize this is not a saying, but look at me, but it's saying, if you understand that, then you can receive what I'm about to say to you. And even that requires this uh, countercultural absurdity of recognizing that what I thought I was doing, what well, God has done in Christ, not in the law.